Hello and welcome to my brand new series, Linux for Noobs. And this is for those of you that need a little helping hand getting on board with Linux. And specifically in today's video, we are going to talk about why there are so many Linux distributions. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? And which one should you start with? That's what we're going to cover today. But before we get into that, I do want to mention my sponsor, Linode. Linode is my actual infrastructure provider for my YouTube channel, and I couldn't be happier to have them as a sponsor. Linode has been doing cloud computing since 2003, which is actually before Amazon Web Services was even a thing. On Linode's platform, you can get your server up and running in minutes, and they include all of the popular distributions, such as CentOS, Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, and get this, also Arch Linux. And let's be honest, what could be better than a Linux cloud server provider that allows you to tell all of your friends, I run Arch? Linode has multiple server plans available to make any app scalable and flexible. You can use it to host a blog, set up a VPN server, a Minecraft server, or you could do what I did and set up a website for your YouTube channel because the official website for Learn Linux TV runs on Linode. And Linode offers 24 by 7, 365 support, regardless of plan size, so you can get live help from a real person when you need it. New users can get started right now with $100 in credit towards a new account. And I highly recommend you check them out because Linode is awesome. I really appreciate Linode sponsorship. Thank you so much. Now, before we get into the main content in this episode, I do want to give you guys a basic idea of how this series is structured since this is technically the first episode. Now, speaking of that, there is an episode number in the title, but the first thing I want to point out is that it doesn't matter if you watch every episode in this series because each episode is designed to be as standalone as possible. I might refer to other episodes here and there, and that's why I even have episode numbers in the first place. However, I just want to let you guys know that they are standalone, so you'll watch the episodes that contain content that you want to learn about and skip the ones that are about things you already know about. I think that gives you more flexibility, and it makes it so that it's not overwhelming if the series gets to you know hundreds of episodes or something. Who knows? And you feel like you have to watch them all. You don't. Now, when it comes to Cadence, I don't have a schedule yet as far as how often you can expect new episodes in this series, and I don't even have a number of episodes that'll be in this series. This is more of a pilot to see whether or not this idea works, and if you guys are interested in this, if you like this video, make sure you click on the like button and share it to get the numbers up, because the more people that digest each of these episodes the more I will make. So how often and how many depends solely on its popularity. Either the series is going to be awesome and take off and do really well, or, you know, maybe it'll crash and burn. I think that's kind of the fun of seeing where this lands to see how popular it gets. But, you know, the more you guys like it, the more often I'll do these episodes. Now, Linux distributions. Why do we have so many? Now, for those of you that are coming from Windows or Mac OS, and I think, um, you know, probably the majority of you guys that are watching this video are coming from one or the other. And on those platforms, operating systems platforms, I use that term interchangeably, you don't really have much say in how they are designed or structured. If you have Mac OS, then Apple kind of dictates how Mac OS is designed, the user interface, the applications that come with it, and all the inner workings. And the same with Windows. Microsoft determines how that's built, how it's laid out, the user interface, and all of that. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, because if you like the way that Windows is laid out and that works for you, there's no reason not to use it. Use whatever you like. If you are a Mac OS user and that, you know, checks all of your boxes, that's totally fine. But if it doesn't check all of your boxes or your chosen operating system is good enough, then, you know, I think you are missing out on customization. And when it comes to Linux distributions, each of them are basically designed for a different audience. So if you don't like, say, Fedora, maybe you'll like Debian. And if you don't like Debian, maybe you'll like Ubuntu. Each distribution basically caters to a different audience. 
Now that's unlike Windows in Mac OS because you know, when it comes to Mac OS, you use it as is or you don't use it. The same with Windows, you use it as is or you don't use it. Now, yeah, you do get some customization. You could change the wallpaper. Maybe you could change the color scheme a little bit, but you don't really get too many options as far as how you can customize those. Again, if your operating system is laid out the way you want it to already, then you don't care because it's already good enough for you. But when it comes to Linux, if you try a Linux distribution, you have the uh, flexibility that if you don't like it, you could try something else. So maybe Ubuntu's interface, maybe you, you use that, you try it out and you absolutely hate it. You think it's a complete train wreck, no problem. Maybe you like a different distribution better. Maybe a distribution that caters more toward the type of user that you are. There's even distributions that are modeled to act more like Mac OS, some that you know kind of resemble Windows a little bit. And other distributions are something else entirely. So the recommendation is to try multiple distributions. And the beauty of that is most distributions nowadays have a live mode available so you can write the installation image to a flash drive, boot from it, and actually use the distribution without installing it. Now, it may run slower on boot media than if you do install it, but the beauty is you'll get to try it out first. That'll give you an opportunity to make sure that number one, it's compatible with your hardware because the honest truth is that Linux has better hardware compatibility than any other operating system, in my opinion. And if you look at the facts about, you know, Windows, for example, if you install Windows on a you know new machine, you'll probably have a lot of drivers that you have to install manually. But with Linux, you have far fewer drivers to install manually. To be fair, some computers you install Windows, all the drivers are detected. So that's not always the case. But Linux has great hardware support. But that doesn't mean that it's 100%. You could try it out on your computer. Maybe the Wi-Fi doesn't work. Maybe you plug in a second monitor and you can't get dual displays to work. Maybe your sound doesn't work. But in live mode, you can actually find out what does and does not work and then make a, you know, make a choice. Do you want to install it? Well, obviously, if it doesn't detect your hardware, you really don't want to install it. And that's important because, you know, I do see some people will install Linux and then they're like, well, my Wi-Fi card doesn't work. And, you know, sometimes I wonder if maybe live mode isn't advertised as much as it should be because live mode is your opportunity to find that out before you install it if it doesn't work with your hardware. So that's the first thing. And then if it does work with your hardware or and, you know, you, you try it out, you still don't like it, you could just try a different distribution, you know, download that installation image to a flash drive, boot from that, check that one out, you know, try four or five of them and see which one actually works better for you. Now, I'll admit it could be a little overwhelming, and I think I'm putting that lightly. It could be extremely overwhelming to look at the number of distributions. If you check out distrowatch.com, and I actually don't like that site, uh, more on why later, but I bring it up only to give you an example of how many distributions are available, and that's not even an exhaustive list. I mean, there's like up to about 100 or more on that list um, on the right-hand side of the site. And you could see that, yeah, that's pretty overwhelming. So that's quite a lot to choose from. Now, the reason why I don't like DistroWatch is because people misconstrue that top list or top 100, whatever it is, as an indicator of which distribution is number one. Now, the truth is the list on DistroWatch does not correlate to popularity whatsoever. It correlates to how many times the individual distributions page on that site has been clicked it is not representative of which distribution is number one. Now, to be fair, the top 10 distributions are probably the top 10 distributions in actuality. But the order the distributions appear in is never exact. It's never reality. It's just how popular those distributions are on that site. But I mention it to give you an idea of what the top 10 distributions are. You can have a look through those and see if any of those suit your fancy. You can maybe look at screenshots on each individual page to see what it looks like. Maybe one will look more appealing than another. You might get some information as far as what the intended audience is for that distribution. And then you can make an informed decision as far as which one to check out. Now, in my case, when I first started with Linux, I was really curious about it. I was using um, Windows, I think it was 98 at the time, and then I had upgraded to XP. I can't remember if it was before or after XP. I think it was before. 
And I'm curious about it. You know, I'm, I'm really into operating systems at the time. I mean, obviously, I still am, but I was coming up in college, basically. And then I, you know, ask around and, you know, nobody really knows anything about Linux. So I'm kind of on my own. So I go to um, do some searching online and find out there's a ton of distributions and I get overwhelmed. And then I make the decision not to try it out. Surprisingly, I decided, OK, you know what? This is too much for me. I don't want to use Linux because I don't even know which distribution to choose. And obviously, I changed my mind later on down the road. You know, I have a YouTube channel. I write books about Linux. So obviously, my mentality changed. What changed it for me was I had an instructor that, um, you know, visited a class that I was in and said, hey, guys, I'm, I'm going to start a Linux class. If you guys are interested, it's a pilot, just something we're trying out. And if you want to attend, go ahead and sign up. And I did. And the thing is, I didn't have to choose which distribution to go with for the class because the instructor already chose that for us. And then I got obsessed with it. I loved it. I read the book cover to cover twice before the you know class even started. So for me, the choice was made. It was Red Hat. That's what we were going with. Nowadays, I use Pop! OS on my end. That's my distribution of choice. And I've went through several changes here and there, but that's actually what got me on the road to try Linux. And I'm here to tell you now, don't let that stop you. It's actually not a bad thing to have multiple distributions because it gives you more choice than any other platform. Like I mentioned, Windows and Mac OS is Windows and Mac OS. You don't get a choice. You don't get any say in how they're designed. You can't go to the developers and say, hey, I think you can change this. Now, I mean, you kind of can. You can, you know, submit feedback, but you're less likely to have your feedback taken seriously by a proprietary operating system like Windows or Mac OS probably because of the hundreds and you know hundreds of thousands of comments and emails that they get they really can't address all of them um, and that might be why or maybe their uh, board decides all of that for them um, either way um, you don't really get much choice and you know you might not get a choice with a specific Linux distribution if you contact Ubuntu and say that you really hate the dock and you think it should be changed they're probably not going to change it for you but when it comes to distributions, and this is why it's so important to have so many of them, you can, you know, use something else. If Ubuntu doesn't do what you want it to do, doesn't run well for you, you don't like the interface, then you could try a different version of Linux, a different distribution. Some distributions cater to specific audiences, though, and that's another thing that's important to understand. Some distributions cater to advanced users. And I've seen beginners try advanced distributions and get burned out because it's just not user friendly at all. It's for people that, you know, maybe want to just tweak and customize things more, get their hands dirty, so to speak. Advanced distributions are not for those of you that want a set it and forget it default interface with all the defaults that just work. Arch Linux is an advanced distribution. Unless you are interested in computer science and how the inner workings of Linux, well, works, you probably don't want to choose Arch Linux. It's a great distribution, not for beginners. Debian, you know, that's a decent distribution, but it's usually very old in the hardware support department. So if you have an older computer, it'll probably work okay. But if you have a brand new computer, it's most likely the case it will not detect all of your hardware and will just be a frustrating experience. So Debian is awesome, don't get me wrong, but I, I, I think that's an advanced distribution. Now, for beginners, there's Linux Mint, there's Ubuntu, there's Pop! OS. And Ubuntu itself actually has several sub-versions or flavors, like Ubuntu Mate, which is good on older computers, Kubuntu, which is a KDE interface, and maybe we can get into the individual interfaces in a later episode. But the takeaway is that each of the distributions is for a different target audience. Now, there's also distributions that are basically for servers and are not really intended for people that want to run Linux on a laptop or desktop. For example, CentOS. CentOS is primarily made for servers, same with Red Hat, and they're related, long story, we'll get to that eventually. But, you know, if you're not running a server, you probably don't want to choose those. Now, you will find people that are running server-based distributions on their laptop or desktop, and that doesn't mean that it's recommended just because it works for them, they just have a preference, they made it work, that's fine. But uh, some distributions are for servers, you have utility distributions, like some that'll help you uh, rescue a failed computer, access the hard drive when the operating system doesn't boot. So that's not a distribution you'll run on your, you know, your laptop or desktop. 
That's a distribution that you'll use when you have a problem. There's also one called Clonezilla, one of my favorites. That's for cloning hard drives. That's all it does. You don't install it on your laptop or desktop. You just use it when you want to do that specific thing. Because Linux is open source and all the individual components can be switched out, people are able to make their own distribution for their own thing. And that's why we have so many distributions. It's to the point where someone can try a distribution and love it, but hate one thing and then remaster the whole distribution with that one change, change the name. Um, people actually go to that level, but it gives you choice. And that's why it's important to have multiple distributions. So as far as what to start with, I gave some hints already. Ubuntu, there's Linux Mint, Pop! OS, Ubuntu Mate is another good one. Um, and I know it's spelled mate, but one thing you'll learn about us Linux people, we have weird pronunciations for things. Um, don't ask. It's a long story. Just like gnome, uh, we pronounce it gnome. There's a reason for that. Not going to get into it yet. I don't want to have too much into one episode. I want to make sure that you guys are following along. So what I recommend at this point in your journey, if you are just starting out with Linux, is download the um, distribution that you want to start with, any of the ones I mentioned. Just download the installation media. And you can use a utility called Etcher to create a bootable flash drive. You can reboot your computer. You can go to the boot menu. That's different on every computer. You can boot from the flash drive. You know, enter live mode and you can use the distribution. Don't install it. Just, you know, check it out. And then, you know, try a handful of them and see which one you like best. And then, you know, if you are watching this on YouTube, then let me know in the comments what you think. And I'll be interested to hear what you have to say. But that was the first episode. I hope it was helpful. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Subscribe if you haven't already done so. And if you like this video, definitely share it with all of your friends on Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, whatever you have to spread it. And the more views it gets, the more I will do. And if you like it, let me know. If, you, if there's certain things you want me to cover, let me know that too. And until then, I'll see you in the next episode.